when we have met to worship and adore the Lord and God. Will you pray with expectation as we preach the living word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray, and God's great blessing will be showered all around. Let us love our God supremely, let us love our brothers too. Let us pray and care for people till our God makes all things new. When at last we're called to heaven, in his presence we'll sit down. And the Lord will then reward us, giving us a heavenly taken from Mark chapter 9 verses 30 to 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it for he was teaching his disciples saying to them the son of man is to be betrayed into human hands and they will kill him and three days after being killed he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they went to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another 
who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. May God bless to our understanding this scripture reading. There's a, a picture, a cartoon actually, on the screen. And the one half of the cartoon is a man standing on a very, very tiny island um, in the middle of the ocean. And he sees something coming and he yells, boat. And then on the other half of the cartoon, there's this man in this little tiny boat heading towards the man on the island. And he is yelling, land. It's all about perspective. Perspective is a way of thinking about something, or it's a way of sensibly judging how good or bad, important, etc., something is compared to something else. For instance, is this chocolate cake better than that one? Or it's a method in art of showing distance by making faraway objects seem smaller. Our poor PowerPoint cover pages show different line perspectives. For today, though, we're going to be thinking about perspective as the first definition, a way of thinking about something. A number of years ago in Toronto, a woman backed out of her driveway and ran over a little nine-year-old boy. The child was trapped under the woman's car. The mom was there crying. The way everyone was thinking about that scene was that the that the boy was trapped and that the boy would die. That was everyone's perspective as they gathered around the horror. Let us pray. Gracious God, you invite us all the time to change our way of thinking, to change our perspective. And as we listen, as we reflect on the scripture <clears throat> that Jane so eloquently read for us, Help us to hear what your spirit is saying to us each individually, but also as a church. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our loving God. Amen. So in the scripture that jo Jane read for us, God is inviting us to change perspective. Two years ago, you as a church began to rethink how Humbercrest would look and how you would do God's ministry. You had a visioning survey and came up with some very great ideas. And last year, you decided to hire an interim minister. And here we are now finishing up our first year together. God has been inviting us over and over again to rethink ministry. And our work together has been finding God's different perspective for ministry here. We have been working through a lot of change, and it's been a challenging but inspiring journey. In our gospel lesson, Jesus is inviting the disciples to consider God's perspective rather than their own. First, Jesus has been talking about being betrayed, being murdered, and then being raised to life. And after that chewy morsel, you would almost think that they would be asking questions about that. But the disciples are wondering, who will be first? Dis disciples were no different than any of us. They wanted to be first, and who does it? Some of us know the pain of being chosen last for the sports team or the debating team, or the cheerleading squad. Nobody likes last place. So then Jesus draws a child into their midst and tells them that if they want to be first, they have to be last and welcome into their lives this child 
In this world where being first matters most, we along with the disciples certainly need to find perspective in this scripture. Jesus never condemns them for wanting to be great. But he shifts their perspective to being great for God. As I've been reflecting on this concept for some time now, my art has taken a more refined perspective as I am trying to honor God through my art. Would this piece of art bring glory to God and God's mission? So what about you and your gifting? And please don't tell me you don't have one because we all have gifts. Sometimes we haven't been encouraged to use them, perhaps as we should have been, or perhaps they've been stomped on by some people. I think I told you about my grade six teacher who held up one of my pieces of art when I was in grade six. My father being an artist and making his living as a musician and as an artist and the grade six teacher held up my my piece of art and he said look everyone look 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 so of course everyone looked and he said this is Mary Jo's work and this is the best that she can do and her artist her father being an artist so that altered how I saw my gifting. So maybe your gifting has been tromped on by somebody. But how can we use them for God's mission and glory? In the gospel account, Jesus is inviting the disciples to think differently about how to interrelate with other people. He was inviting them to consider God's perspective when seeing others and being with them. Jesus invites them to reimagine their world that includes all of humanity. In last week's gospel lesson, Jesus asked them to deny themselves and choose life, as Reverend Nancy inspiringly put it. And here in Mark 9, Jesus ups the ante by asking the disciples, to consider seeing themselves as servants to others. He also goes on to say that to welcome a child, really to welcome the most vulnerable in their society was to welcome him and ultimately God. Theologian John Donahue states that at the time of Jesus, children were non-persons, where a child was a nobody unless its father accepted it where it was commonplace and legal for children to be dumped in the gutter or rubbish dump to die, or to be taken by someone who wished to rear a slave. Contrary to the disciples' desire for positions of greatness and power and importance, Jesus is suggesting that they should be more concerned with honoring into their midst the poor and the vulnerable. Reimagining their world by enlarging their feelings of self to include their neighbor. What a radical way to include, to ignore or push the social boundaries of Jesus society. In acts of caring for vulnerable human beings, we come face to face with the divine. And Donahue concludes, this is an important story and everyone should hear it. And I couldn't agree more. Theologian K. Peters quotes, as a result of the rise of Western style democracies, free market economies and modern science and technology in the last couple of hundred years or so, many of us enjoy an increased material prosperity. But this is a two-sided coin, he continues. At the same time as all this has been happening, some are beginning to recognize that this modern material prosperity is, in, uh, is harming other creatures 
diminishing the functions of ecosystems and altering our global patterns. Australian New Testament scholar William Loder suggests human beings have mostly attributed value to those who have power. At some levels, that has been physical power. It is equally about having wealth, political power, family power. They are saying such people are of greater value. And Justice Enfield says, it's often been said that a society's moral strength is measured by how humanly it deals with its most vulnerable individuals living within its domain. And Jerry Stinson writes, our living must be set in the context of the larger life we call the universe. Life's choices are ours to make. Once we have heard the cry of a planet or our neighbor's cultural or religious pain or the most vulnerable in our society, we do need to make a choice about what we will do. Does the spirit of compassion and inclusiveness at the heart of Jesus' life make a difference when we make these decisions? The act of welcoming vulnerability flies in the face of the me first world in which we live in. Our primal instincts want us to fend for ourselves by putting ourselves in positions of power Jesus reminds us that to embrace this divine perspective is to put aside the usual definitions of success and honor. Jesus is inviting the disciples and ourselves to go beyond those primal instincts and become vulnerable to each other in order for us to enter into various interrelationships in service and vulnerability. This kind of living, being vulnerable with each other, and learning to serve each other and the world is transformational, not just for us individually, but for this church and for the continued plans that God has for Humbercrest. It's the kind of being in this world that can impact not only this church, but the community that Humbercrest rests in. It's about finding a new perspective, a new way of thinking about God's people to the world and about being God's people to the world. It's about taking God's perspective of servanthood and using God's wisdom to help transform our lives and those around us. So let's get back to that poor little nine-year-old who was trapped under the neighbor's car. The scene was one of horror for the mom as it looked like her son could die. The perspective was that the child was pinned under a 2000 pound vehicle until a tow truck would come along and lift it off him. However, someone took a different perspective and suggested that they, the bystanders, could lift that car. And within a short period of time, strangers were gathering around this mom and her hurt son and were lifting this ton of weight off this child. By the time the paramedics arrived, the car was over to the side and the child was rushed to hospital where he was examined and kept overnight for observation. He made a full recovery. Our taking God's perspective, my friends, of being a servant to all and using God's wisdom might just help us to take a great load of weight off someone this day. Are you up for it? Amen. Come now, you blessed, eat at my table, said the great judge to the righteous above. When I was hungry, thirsty, and homeless, sick and in prison, you showed me your love. 
When did we see you hungry or thirsty? When were you homeless, a stranger alone? When did we see you sick or in prison? What have we done that you call us your own? When you gave bread to earth's hungry children, when you gave welcome to war's refugees, when you remembered those most forgotten, you cared for me in the smallest of these. Christ, when we meet you out on life's roadways, looking to us in the faces of need. Then may we know you, welcome and show you love that is faithful in word and in Christ to 